Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, as I was preparing to write uh, the sermon this morning, I came across an article about a real problem that is affecting a lot of people in our world, and it's not COVID. Uh, it's another form of sickness called hurry sickness. Hurry sickness uh, was actually first coined back in the 1950s, and it has grown over time with every generation. It was Dr. Larry Dossey of Dallas, Texas. He came up with that phrase, hurry sickness, as a way to describe some of the things that are going on in our society. Uh, it's what? People, right? People rushing about. People who have this compulsion to do everything quickly. It's this chronic feeling that we're always looking at our watch and we feel rushed. We feel like we, we don't have enough time in the day. We feel rushed and being short on time. And it's attributed to the fast place, modern lifestyle that we all lead. And this brings on other symptoms like anxiety and depression and insomnia. Dr. Larry said that hurry sickness is an increased sensitivity to the passage of time. Now, I'm not sure where you are, but I am not afraid to admit I know more about this problem than I would like. I mean, I find that I'm, I've, been, I've been in a hurry for so long, I can't remember when I wasn't. Fashion designer Tom Ford once said, from the time we're born until we die, we are kept busy with artificial stuff that isn't important. We'll, we'll even use busy language, right? Things we talk about, the way we talk describes our busyness. People talk about being uh, in the fast lane, right? Or I'm living in the fast lane. Or I feel like my plate's too full. Or, you know, I just don't have enough time in the day. Or we're constantly looking at our watch and we're saying, look at the time, I'm going to be late. In a world that often feels fast-paced and busier and more hectic than ever, it's easy to get swept up in this whole idea of needing to do more just to keep up. But the trouble is, sometimes we spend so much time and energy trying to keep up and put everything into our day that we can't ever stop and actually enjoy our life. Listen, if you find yourself feeling overwhelmed, frantic, or like you're just always rushing from one thing to the next, learn to slow down. It might be the thing that saves you. Because when you're intentional, because that's the key, and we'll talk about that a little later. When you're intentional about slowing down, it's gonna help you become more present and more mindful of the day that you're living in. And even better, when you're not rushing from one thing to the next or struggling just to keep up, you're gonna enjoy your life a lot more. Learning to slow down isn't easy. In fact, it takes very intentional effort to resist that idea that being busy is better or that being busy somehow equals importance or how being busy sometimes increases productivity. So that means we have to choose to slow down. And I know that sounds ridiculous <laughs> because we all hate to wait. At the post office, we sigh impatiently if the person ahead of us is taking forever. We hate traffic lights. As we approach a red light, we look to see what kind of vehicles are already stopped up there. And if there's a truck or an older looking car in one lane, we kind of quickly move over uh, to the other lane because we think somehow we'll get a quick getaway. At the supermarket, if you're choosing between two checkout lanes, you kind of do that grocery store math really quickly in your head. You know, we all do it. You look at the number of people that are in each line and then you multiply that by the number of items they have in each cart. Joanna and I, uh, we just rode an airplane. My goodness. It's the same thing. You know, as soon as the plane lands, as soon as the seatbelt sign goes off, people stand up and they grab their carry-on and they crowd into the aisle, fully knowing they're going to have to stand there for 10 minutes before they open the doors and let us out. And even when they do let us out, right, all we're doing is we're all rushing to the baggage carousel so that we can wait once more because our luggage isn't there yet. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think, I think we all want to slow down collectively. I think we do, but 
we're afraid. We're afraid if we slow down, somebody else will get there first. Or we're afraid that if we slow down, the world will just fall apart. Sadly, the reality is one day we will all slow down permanently. And you know when that happens, the world will go right on spinning without us. This morning I want to tell you this. Slow down. Have you ever heard somebody say, my how time flies? Or, wow, the years just seem to fly by. Time doesn't really fly. The clock ticks away at the same speed every single day. The days of the week, the years that pass, they happen at the same speed, and they've done so ever since the dawn of time. We keep blaming time, but it's us. We are the ones that feel this need to rush about. The fault doesn't lie with, lie with time. You and I, we have the same time in every single day. Time is a gift from God, and God gives us time, and we need to do everything we can to make use of that time. God gives us time to work, time to worship, time to pray, time to spend time with our families, time to serve and help other people, time to witness and help others learn more about Jesus. You know that even back in Jesus' day, people felt rushed and hurried. So Jesus would often model patience. Jesus modeled a lifestyle of stillness and slowness. Jesus says in Matthew, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, if you feel rushed and hurried, if you feel like you're moving at a fast pace, come to me, right? He says, come to me, lay your burden down, and you will find rest. What a wonderful phrase. What wonderful hope we have here that Christ, our King, offers us slowness and stillness and rest. To be honest, if we were going to be honest with ourselves, we would admit we need that. We need it. I need it. In a life where we experience so many trials and hardships and we experience so many difficulties and so much pain, life can make you tired. And all of this business of running around can make you exhausted. So I think when the Bible starts talking about rest and Sabbath and slowing down, we should all pay attention because we need that. We all need a break, don't we? Life can be tiring. And there's so much to do, and it seems like the older you get, the less energy you have to do it. Our lives sometimes seem like one long list of to-do lists, just one thing after another. And it's further complicated by unexpected expenses and financial uh, pressures and personal things going on in our lives, and we got a family crisis over here, and we just are having a lack of energy to do it all. There's just so much to do. There's so much on the to-do list. Isaiah 30 says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. The prophet Isaiah says, In repentance there is rest. There's rest in your salvation. Exodus 20 says, Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your field male servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. In Exodus we receive a command. Just like God rested, you rest. You need rest. You need a day to slow down. We are supposed to take a Sabbath. And we know that, right? Sunday. Sunday is typically the day that we're supposed to rest, right? That's our Sabbath. But resting feels counterproductive. For some reason, we feel guilty if we stop and take a break. To take a whole day off from work, 
You know, the rest of the world, they're going to catch up. They're going to get ahead of you. Someone else is going to get there first. Someone else is going to work harder. And while we have our feet up, they're out there winning. Ecclesiastes 3 says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under the sun. You know what that means? It means God gave us an adequate amount of time to accomplish everything that's important. God didn't make a mistake. He didn't make days too short. When God created the world, he created the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars. He created all of that, and it would spin around the sun. And very early on, we learned to trace those movements, and we learned to measure time. And so we have 24 hours in every single day to work, sleep, rest, play, worship, pray, take care of our business, enjoy our family, enjoy our friends, and to pursue any sort of personal project. What is fascinating to consider is that every single one of us gets the same amount of time every single day. It doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what commitment uh, you've made to this person or that. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what city, what country. Each person on this planet gets the exact same amount of time every single day. And it's what we do with our time that defines us. And it's amazing that two different people can make such a vastly uh, different use of that time. Benjamin Franklin said, lost time is never found again. And it's true. The earth spins around, and once it's done, the day is gone, and you never get it back. And there are so, so few hours in a day, right? At the end of the day, when you find that you don't have the time to do the important things that you wanted to do, you have to go back to yourself and say, I didn't manage my time correctly. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know that anyone who has ever lost a spouse or anyone who's lost someone close to them will tell you, life is short. And Paul agrees. He says, be wise with your time. Make the most use of it. And James would say the same thing. James 4, he says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. James says, don't presume that you will have tomorrow. Don't talk about the good that you will do one day. We see we're always putting those things aside. We're putting those things aside, those things that are important, those things that we say that we want to do or we want to accomplish in life, and, it, and uh, we're not focusing on the things that really are important. Our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, those we love, relationships. And yeah, we're filling all of our time with our job and our TV and making money and these stupid phones. And you know what's ironic? My son will ask me to spend time with him, to do something with him, and I'll be sitting at my computer and I'll be doing work and I will tell him to wait. Isn't that stupid? He'll never be seven again. And when he's eight or nine or ten, I'll say, where did the time go? See, it's in all of our rushing and busyness. God tells us to wait. You know, as our father, that's his advice. He tells us to wait, but for a different reason. We read most of these wait passages in the Bible. We even read one of them last Sunday. We can read it again. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Friends, sometimes we just need to slow down. There's a time for everything. So we just have to learn to manage our time well. And it begins with prayer. It begins with the Word of God, like we've been talking about, and making sure your priorities line up with what's important. Line your priorities up with God's priorities. Are you loving God more? Are you loving your neighbor more? Because if you're not, it's probably because you're moving at 100 miles per hour. It's hard to love someone going 100 miles an hour. Are you making time for your family? Or are you just providing for them? Are you getting adequate rest? Are you getting adequate exercise? Do you make personal time every single day for God? Do you spend time in prayer? Do you worship regularly? Regularly, weekly? Not when it can fit into your schedule. Do you worship? Because you know what I think? I think the world teaches us to be busy. Busy, we've learned from our parents. We learned it in school. We learned it from our jobs. We learned it from the world around us. But resting, resting is always talked about negatively. And so we never actually learn how to rest correctly. I want to teach you some easy tools that will help you slow down. And the first is, go outside. Go outside. Get out of the office. Get out of the house. Spend some time outside, in nature, breathing air. Going outside has a huge range of benefits, both physically and mentally. Going outside can lower your blood pressure. Going outside can reduce feelings of stress. It can reduce your anxiety. It can increase your creativity. It can increase your memory. It can increase your immunity. But another great benefit of going outside in nature is that it helps you slow down. It helps you let go of some of that busyness that you're carrying in life. Go for a walk or just sit outside for a few min minutes. It'll do your mind and your body good. And then while you're outside, enjoy that cup of coffee or tea. Remember when drinking tea or coffee was fun? <laughs> now you drink it on the go. Now you drink it while you're in the car. Or you drink it while you check your phone. You drink your coffee while you work. Try to be present in that moment. Try to experience your favorite drink. I mean, really taste it. Notice and pay attention to the color and the smell and the taste. And all of that means is, I want you to start your day intentionally slower. How you start your day usually sets the tone for the rest of your day. When you start your day in a rush, you're gonna feel rushed. You're gonna feel frantic. You're gonna feel behind one step the rest of your day. A great way to learn how to slow down is to intentionally start slow at the very beginning, which probably means you'll have to wake up just a little earlier. So do that. Get up 15 minutes earlier than you're used to and enjoy that cup of coffee outside and start your day slower. If you can start slower and, and, not, and not rush, then you can also include all of the other things you do in the morning that you enjoy. That slowness is going to make you feel good and it's going to help you have a positive outlook on the rest of your day. Now you could say, well, Pastor David, I don't drink coffee. I don't drink tea. Okay, that's fine. Take that 15 minutes and meditate. Journal. Read. Exercise. Stretch. Have a few minutes in the sunrise while everybody else in the house is asleep. If you start your day slower and with more intention, your mornings are going to be more enjoyable. And hopefully, you can carry that slow attitude the rest of your day. And you can carry that peace with you for the rest of your day. I, I, and I, I know I said meditate back there. And I don't want you to think that's some sort of uh, mystic voodoo stuff. All meditation is is spending a few minutes with your breathing. It's a wonderful and simple way to slow down and take some time to just notice your breath. Noticing your breathing 
is a form of meditation. Meditation doesn't have to be complicated, doesn't have to be intimidating. Try sitting for five minutes and just being aware of your breath. If five minutes is too long, then try two minutes. But when you notice that your mind starts to wander, and it's going to wander, trust me, just return it and say, no, I'm focusing on breathing. And just try taking deep breaths. Deep breathing is another great way to slow the pace down, especially when you feel rushed or busy or you feel like you've got a lot of things going on that are all jumbled up in your head. Inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth, and try to help reduce some of that stress that you're feeling. You say, well, what if my phone rings or what if I get a text message? Simple. Turn your phone off. Turn your phone off. Technology, hey, it's a wonderful thing. It makes life easier in so many ways and it provides opportunities for us to innovate and connect with each other and to create, but it can also become this time-sucking, all-consuming black hole. Or it becomes this way for us to always be available because we're always plugged in. Some of us, we grab our phone right after we wake up. You know, it's the last thing you look at before you went to sleep. It's the first thing you look at when you wake up. A great way to practice slowing down is unplug. Turn your phone off for an hour. Turn your phone off for a weekend. At the very least, try silencing some of it or all of it. Turn your notifications off. Every time you get a notification, go into your settings and turn that notification off so that you stop looking at it so much. Technology is great, but only if you have boundaries. Only if it adds value to your life. It shouldn't be a distraction to your life, and it shouldn't take your life away from the things that matter. Turn the other noise off too, you know? Some of us leave the TV on all day. Try turning the TV off. Turn music off in your car. Turn that podcast off when you run. Turn the radio off when you're driving to the store. For a few hours, give yourself silence. There doesn't have to be so much noise. Take a minute and notice where you are. Pay attention to your surroundings. Look at what's going on around you. Notice other people. Make eye contact with them. You know, when you're at soccer practice or when you're at dance practice or you're out to lunch with somebody, really listen to the people that are around you. Listen to conversations. Find moments of connection where other people are talking and be present in those conversations. Another thing I would say is try giving stuff away. Listen, one of my favorite ways to slow down, one of my favorite ways to simplify is just by cleaning the house. Clean the house, clear the clutter, clear out the closets, clear out the garage, clear out the attic, clear out the shed. Get rid of stuff. When you have less stuff in your home, then you have less stuff that requires your time, less stuff that requires your energy, less stuff that requires your attention because you're managing it, all of it, all the time. When there's, when there's less stuff, there's less stuff to trip over, less stuff to walk around, less stuff to look at, less stuff to worry about, less stuff to clean. I know you think that one day you just might go back and use those old jazzercise VHS cassettes. You won't. You know, you're thinking, now one day I'm gonna give my pet rock collection to my grandkids. They don't want it. Hey, you haven't touched it in 20 years. Get rid of it. You're never gonna read those old Tom Clancy books again. Get rid of them. Think about it this way. Every piece of clutter that you remove from your house, it's gonna to add to more time in your life, more energy in your life, and you're gonna you're going to get to reclaim all of that. What about your schedule? Could you clean up your schedule? Do it. Say no to something. Say no to something. Say no to a couple of things. Free up your schedule. An important way to start adding free space to your schedule is just practice saying no more often. Learning to say no, I know, 
It's hard at first, especially if you're the kind of person that likes to please everyone and you don't want to feel like you've let somebody down. But learning to say no to an obligation is an important way to set boundaries. And it helps you protect your time and your family and your well-being. And it's going to do wonders to help you slow down. If life is feeling busy or hectic or overwhelming, a great way to slow down is to start removing some of those activities from your life. Those are commitments that are clogging up your calendar. I mean, take a look. Take a real hard, critical look at that calendar, that schedule, and look for any commitments that make you roll your eyes or shrug or sigh. Any commitments that you don't enjoy. They're not working for you. They're not working for your family. Your kid complains. He doesn't want to go to that anyway. They're probably adding less value to your life and adding more stress to your life. And you can start to slowly work things back into your schedule. You can, but only after you set new priorities. Set some new priorities. Because when you have clear priorities in your life, that's an important part of simplifying the calendar. When you have a clear priority and you know this is the, this is the current season that my life is in, my family is in, I know what's going to add value to my life, so I know the things that I'm going to say yes to and the things that I'm going to say no to. Knowing exactly what your priorities are gives you a compass and it helps you steer and guide and help you make decisions. And you'll know how to spend your time and you'll know how to give your energy away and you'll know how to give your money away so that you can keep your focus and maybe even keep your busyness. But it won't feel stressful. Last, I would say stop multitasking. Stop multitasking. Do one thing at a time. When we start multitasking, we start losing track of all the things that we have to do, all the things we've said yes to, and we'll create this sense that we've forgotten something or misplaced something, and it creates worry in us, and it even will give us nightmares. We used to think this was a skill set. You know, we'd write, I can multitask on our resumes, but in truth, very few people can multitask well. Usually multitasking leaves you feeling rushed and stressed. And really, at the end of the day, you end up doing an okay job on everything. Everything gets done at a level of mediocrity when you multitask. Instead, do one thing at a time. Slow down. Not multitasking helps us slow down, but there's also a chance that you'll do a better job. And when you've done a better job, you'll feel better about yourself. You present a better image of yourself, and that positive energy is going to help you feel better and more at peace. Does multitasking really help you feel more accomplished? Do you enjoy pushing product out? or pushing parts of yourself out, or projecting this image of yourself that is kind of just phoning it in. You want to enjoy life. Slow down. Slow down. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. That's God's advice. Be still and know that I am God. What great advice. I can give all my worry to the God of the universe. I can give all of my rushing about, my, my speed and my anxiety and my stress, I can give it all to the God of the universe if I am still and I recognize that He is God. He can multitask. He can accomplish. He will get the job done. I don't have to. I don't have to rush around. The Bible tells me to wait upon the Lord, to be still and know that He is God, that the sheep hear His voice. That requires me to slow down. That requires me to simplify. And I think if I can slow down and simplify, I'll enjoy life more. And I'll live my best life. 
Let's pray together. Lord, please put your peace in my heart when I'm worried and anxious, when my mind races and obsesses, when I can't help but think about my problems, and then the more I think about them, the more depressed I become. Some days I feel like I'm sinking in quicksand and I can't get out. Calm me, Lord. Slow me down. Put your peace in my heart. No matter what problem I have, Lord, you are bigger. You are more powerful than my problems. You are larger than my problems, so I bring my problems to you. I want to know what you want. I want to know your will for my life. I want to know that you can take the burden and turn it into salvation. I don't know what's good. Choose for me the path. I trust you. I trust your goodness and your wisdom, and I place all of it in your hands. Fill my heart with peace. Help me to slow down and simplify and live my best life. Amen. Hey, thanks for taking uh, the morning with us. I hope that you are able to watch and focus and not multitask, even while you watch this video. I hope this was encouraging to you to slow down and enjoy your life. Hey, we want you to return to worship. We want you here back in the church. We love you and we miss your face. And so we have two services every Sunday, one at 9.30, which is our traditional service. We have a choir. And then we have a service at 11 o'clock that is with our contemporary worship team. We also have a children's program and youth group that meets during that time. We also have a local uh, youth group that meets in our community. So Wednesdays at 6, we have junior high and senior high. They meet in our rear building. We feed them. So please send your kid over on a skateboard or their bicycle. Uh, we'll feed them dinner and we'll send them back to you about an hour and a half later. Uh, we'd love to be the church where you live. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.